You're listening to Modern Intimacy, a show about mental health, sex, relationships, and the private things we need to talk about more publicly. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri. As a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and packed trained couples therapist, I help people live more fulfilled lives by shattering stigma, erasing shame, and building connections. It's no secret that we live in a society that compartmentalizes mental health and sex from our everyday lives. On this show, we're going to change that, and we'll do it by getting curious together. In this podcast, I'll invite you to join me as I investigate the relationship between sex, mental health, relationships, and modern society. In each episode, it's my goal to provide safe, smart, dimensional, and practical answers to those complex questions you've been wondering about. Head on over to modernintimacy.com slash podcast for show notes and resources, or to submit a question or topic you'd like me to explore in future episodes, as well as to find all the links to follow us on your favorite podcast apps so you don't miss an episode. Don't forget to follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Dr. Kate Balistrieri for daily tips on how to improve your mental health, sex, and relationships. Everyone has questions. You are not alone. On this show, I make information accessible because everyone deserves to have more integrated, healthy, and sexually satisfying relationships. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. Thank you so much for for joining me today on the podcast. I'm so honored to get to speak with you about uh, chronic illness and disability and sexuality. I feel like it's such an under-discussed conversation and Mm -hmm. probably one of the areas where I get a lot of inquiries. Um, So I wonder, Mm -hmm. can you tell uh, my listeners a little bit about yourself, how you got into this uh, field and this specialty? Sure. So I was a geriatric psychotherapist for a good five years at a community Mm -hmm. mental health clinic. And a lot of the folks that were coming in, the clients had chronic illness and chronic pain conditions, everything from autoimmune disorders to neurological diseases and things. But then I started seeing younger people come in and they were having a lot of symptoms, fatigue, not feeling well, muscle pain, all kinds Mm -hmm. of things. And they started talking about sexual issues. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, that's very interesting, but I didn't do anything with it at that time. I ended up moving to DC Mm -hmm. to take a job working in behavioral health administration at a hospital. And I did Mm -hmm. not like it. I could push paper all day. (laughs) No, I supervised about five clinicians who were, they Mm -hmm. were all fantastic, but I felt like there was something more for me. Mm -hmm. And that was really getting back into clinical work. Mm -hmm. So I joined a group private practice. And during that time, I attended a workshop in Maryland and it was on building your private practice. And the woman that facilitated that workshop, who's now one of my mentors, um, she said, have you ever, well, she asked me what I did. And I said, I specialize in treating chronic pain, chronic illness, Mm -hmm. you know, as a psychotherapist. And she said, have you ever thought about becoming a sex therapist? Because people really want to work on reclaiming their sexuality due to an illness or a disability, or Mm -hmm. they want to find out what sex is to them as a disabled person. And I Mm -hmm. said, no, but that sounds interesting. So I started the ASECT process. Okay. And you know, the certification process is very timely and there's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And so I started the process and that's really where things started to take off. I started to get more clients that were coming in with chronic illness and chronic pain that had low sexual desire and arousal. And they really Mm -hmm. wanted to reclaim that. Mm -hmm. And it just really picked up. And then I started speaking on it, um, writing about it, blogging about it, doing podcasts on it. And so that's, and that's where I'm at now. And the journey (laughs) has been great. Oh, that's amazing. That is amazing. And Mm -hmm. your podcast, Sex and Chronic Illness is recent, right? You've just started this this year. I did. I started it actually September of last year, but um, I've only had about six episodes. I try to do an episode once a month. That's all I have time for right now, but I'm Mm -hmm. hoping that I can increase that. And I'm actually part of a podcast network. So it's a chronic illness podcast network. So there's uh, four of us. There's the explicitly sick podcast. There's the human care podcast, Mm -hmm. another one called discomfort zone. Mm -hmm. And also there's my podcast, the sex and chronic illness podcast. And it's been a great journey with those guys. Wow. It sounds like such a really lovely wellspring of resources for people. 
Yeah, it's so needed. Yeah. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about, um, I have people on there who are also sex experts and sex therapists and mm -hmm. sex educators, and then folks on there that are willing to just share their story about their chronic illness mm -hmm. journey and also how it has affected their sex life and how sex has been a great thing when you're coping with chronic illness and disability. Yes, it can be. <laughs> What's an example of how sex can be really part of a, a healing and like positive aspect of moving through chronic pain or chronic illness? I love that question. And I think it's all about getting creative in your body, mm. which I love, you mm -hmm. know, I think that I always look at the body like a blueprint of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so we have to find, you know, we're raised in this society and taught in society that sex is penetrative and there's mm -hmm. one form of sex and it has to be this way and you have to perform. But when you are disabled, you're not able to do those things. And so we have to get creative. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my clients, I help them getting creative with their sex. My mantra has always been, um, get curious about your partner and get creative with your sex. Oh, I love that. So getting curious what? about what it is that you love to do as a sexual mm -hmm. person and what mm -hmm. can you do to please yourself and to show your partner that. Yeah. So I think that's the way to cope with it because mm -hmm. we have, you know, the biological, the cognitive and the social aspects of chronic illness. And so you're able to work on all three of those with sex. That is a really good point. I mean, I often think about sex as a whole body experience, which is in direct contrast to a lot of what we're taught, as you mentioned. Right. So often the focus is on penetration or genital stimulation. Yes. And it really does us all a disservice because mm -hmm. there's all of this other landscape all over our whole bodies. And right. what I love about your mantra is that it really mm -hmm. invites people to get more creative and exploratory with the rest of their canvas. Exactly. Right. Because the skin is mm. everywhere and touch mm. and the power of touch and the, the mouth and things that you can do and getting more creative. It's not mm -hmm. about, I think we've got to get away from the genital sometimes when it comes to, you know, chronic illness and sex and disability and also with chronic pain, because there may be areas on the body that are sensitive to touch. A lot of my clients of have fibromyalgia. And so mm. they're very sensitive, but there may be parts on their body where there's pleasure. Sure. And I think it's important to talk about pleasure. Pleasure does not mean sexual pleasure. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of things with pleasure. And so mm -hmm. we have to really hone into that and think about that. What are some of the things that people working with you are surprised to learn as they start to embark on this kind of new way of thinking about pleasure and thinking about sex? I think a lot of it has to do with hope because when mm. people come in to see me, and they have survived cancer or they are fighting an autoimmune disease or they have um, lost the feeling in the waist down. Mm. There is this stereotype that they are asexual and they should not have sex and that mm. they are broken. Mm. And so when they come in, we start to work on their thought process and find out, well, you can be sexual. Not that there's nothing wrong with asexuality, but a lot of times they're told that. There's right. a message that they get. So I think what right. they learn very quickly is that I am a sexual person and mm -hmm. I can find out what that is for me and what does sex mean to me? Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's a really important, I think, paradigm shift because yeah. again, we're, we're given these messages about sex can exist this way or your identity as a person, as a sexual being is limited to these certain prescriptions mm -hmm. given to us by society or by what we see in mainstream pornography. And so it, it really, exactly. yeah, there's yes. not a lot of inclusivity of thought, right? When it comes to how to be sexual and what does sex even really mean? How do you define that? Like, what does sex mean to you? Sex, sex to me means it's whatever, it's whatever you find pleasurable for you, right? Whether mm -hmm. that is solo masturbation, solo mm -hmm. sex, masturbation, mutual masturbation. I think we're brought up into the society where that's discounted and sex is mm -hmm. penetrative sex, right? Mm -hmm. But is it oral stimulation? Like, what does it mean to you to be sexual? And your sexuality is unique. It's not the same as everybody else. It's not, exactly. a, it's not a cookie cutter of something, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have to define 
what is that? And I mm-hmm. think a lot of times when we're brought up from childhood, there's these messages that we get mm-hmm. on what sex is. And unfortunately, sex education, where we're brought up and it's like, okay, if you have sex, you're going to get an STI or you're going to get pregnant or you're going to get someone pregnant. Yeah. So when, I heard, when I heard those messages, it made me want to have sex. Hmm. I was like, I'm more curious about it now. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of oppositionality in you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to try it. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 No, I hear that. Um, you know, I grew up with uh, very um, conservative views about sexuality and a lot of shaming messages sure. about sex, right? If, yes. if you do this, then it means X about you. If you do that, it means Y about you. And mm-hmm. we don't even really realize the extent to which some of those messages really infiltrate the way we see ourselves as partners, the way we see ourselves as individuals, the way we see ourselves as um, creative, spontaneous sexual beings. And it, it can really inhibit our potential. It so, really can. It really yeah. can. And I think in our work as therapists, we hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. I know for me, whether I'm working with someone who's able-bodied or I'm working with someone who has a disability, that um, there's shame and we have to unpack that. It's like layers of it. It's like trauma. We peel it back like an onion Mm -hmm. and we go through those things. And so I like that you bring that up because it is about shame sometimes. It is. And and I, I really appreciate the complexities of having lots of different um, areas of your life where shame might be a Mm -hmm. a very, um, you know, a loud feeling. Yes. Right? And so learning how to kind of disentangle that and, and take shame out of the equation, unless of course that's your kink, then invite it in. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have to, we have to also look at that too, right? It may yeah. be a kink for someone, right? But right. for others, it, it can be there. And it's yeah. one of those emotions or things that cover us from head to toe. And mm-hmm. I always call it the shame monster. And sometimes mm. we have to, we've got to confront the shame monster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about um, what are some of the fears of the people that you've worked with who either mm-hmm. have a chronic illness or a disability in talking to new sexual partners about sort of what their sexual interests are, what their limitations are, what their hopes mm-hmm. are? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. I get that quite a bit. And I talk about that with my clients, especially if they are coming in where they just started dating someone or mm-hmm. they're single and they want to date. Mm -hmm. So of course, one of the things that we talk about a lot of times is rejection, Mm -hmm. you know, and when do I disclose that I have a chronic illness or disability? Because a lot of folks, invisible illnesses, we don't see it on the outside. And so when do I share this and do I share it? And so I hold space for that. And we talk about Mm -hmm. the fear and we talk about the anxiety. And I think one of the things that's really important to keep that keep talking about are the strengths that the person has. Mm -hmm. What makes Mm -hmm. you a sexual being? And just because someone may reject you, someone else may not. And Mm. it's finding out what you like sexually and what do you want in a partner? It doesn't matter whether you have a disability. There are people that come in that are abled body and they're single and they want to talk about what they want in a partner. So what do Mm -hmm. you want? What does a relationship look like to you? What does a healthy relationship look like to you? One of the things that I find, um, that I love about my work is that sometimes they'll come in and say, okay, Dr. Lee, I want to put this on an app and I want to read to you what I have on my dating profile and how to navigate that. A lot of times people want to disclose in the beginning because Mm -hmm. they don't want to have to meet someone, really enjoy their time with them, Mm -hmm. get to know them. And then it's like, oh, by the way, I have this. And then it's, it can change the dynamic of the relationship. So You know, some people want to disclose in the beginning. So speaking of apps, there are a number of apps that are available now for Mm -hmm. people who are dating while sick and and they can be really useful, especially now during the pandemic. I wonder, what are your thoughts on on these apps? Are they helpful? Are they harmful? Mm -hmm. I think maybe a little bit of both. I mean, I think that people can get so hooked on them and they get exhausted Mm -hmm. by Mm -hmm. not matching up with someone that they like. So then they get frustrated by it. But I always recommend take a break from it Mm -hmm. if you need to. You don't always have to keep putting yourself out there, but sometimes they can be great because you can really lay out Mm -hmm. what you're looking for. I know when apps first came out, you didn't have the opportunity to to really list the things that you were Mm -hmm. looking for. And what I love about apps 
is that you can go into that detail. Like, this is what I want. This is my education. Mm -hmm. You don't have to list what you do for a living. You could say that you work and then you can disclose more about that later on. (laughs) You know, I mean, in some apps, if you are sexually adventurous and you're kinky, you can put that on there, Mm -hmm. um, that this is what you're looking for. Are Mm -hmm. you monogamous? Are you polyamorous? Mm -hmm. Um, those types of things. So I think they can be very helpful because you know what you're walking into on a date sometimes. What are the apps that you recommend specifically for people who are dating, you know, Mm -hmm. while sick or with a disability? Um, well, a lot of, it depends on what the person's looking for. So, okay. you know, the thing that the one that I always hear about is hinge. I don't mm. know a lot about hinge, but a lot of people use hinge, mm-hmm. especially my, you know, cisgender heterosexual folks. I mm-hmm. always hear about hinge bumble is great because it's the female asking mm-hmm. the male out on a date. So some women want to be adventurous and they may want to try that. Mm-hmm. I, I have several female clients that come in and they just, talk about how they're asking men out. And I think Mm -hmm. that's great. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. It's amazing. (laughs) I love hearing it. I'm like, go girl, you go ahead, ask out the man. If he rejects you, that's okay. Go to the next one. Right. You know, Um, so Hinge, Bumble, if I'm working with my queer clients, the gay community, um, they love, um, what is the one that is, um, hashtag open is one for uh-huh. folks who are non-monogamous. Uh-huh. So there's a couple looking for, to meet another couple or to bring in a third. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really what you want. A lot of my, my gay men that I work with um, use Grindr. If mm-hmm. they want to have sex, they'll use Scruff, mm-hmm. Tinder. Tinder though is interesting because you can find people where you want to have casual sex or you mm-hmm. want to meet and date. Um, which I think is great too, because you mm-hmm. can list where you went to school and what you do for a living. So there's just like a plethora of the just things out there um, mm-hmm. to get into. I wish mm-hmm. there was an app that was, you know, specific for folks that have disabilities. So there's not. There's not. Okay. I haven't seen one. I want all the entrepreneurs listening to take note of that (laughs) and create an app for people who really would benefit from creating community, right? I think it's all about community, right? I think, you know, um, with my LGBTQ folks, you Mm -hmm. know, they've been able to find a lot of friends from these apps. They may Mm -hmm. not, they may not meet each other and start dating, but hey, it's a great way to find friends. Mm -hmm to have Mm -hmm. friends and to have a sense of community. That's what I do love about the disability community is that there are a lot of like programs and, Mm -hmm. you know, resources out there that folks can kind of get involved in. And we're starting to see that more with ASECT and and Mm -hmm. sexuality things. So I think that that's critical Mm -hmm. uh, for people, even if it's friendships, because, you know, I think that's the most important thing too, is just having a support system. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, we really underestimate sometimes the importance of friendships and it can be hard to develop friends as an adult because we don't have all of the, um, you know, kind of ready-made opportunities (laughs) like going to high school, going to college and going to camp, right? You know, all these camps, summer camps, kids parents send their kids to summer camp. (laughs) Right, right. I went to them. I found them traumatic to be honest with you, but (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, but some of them were, were fun. And Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunities for that. Yeah. But creating, creating community and friendship is I think such a necessary aspect of any healthy adult life. Sure. Um, But especially if you're dating, because it can be really easy to make dating your entire world, Mm -hmm. your entire sphere and without Mm -hmm. having balance and people who know you well and who you can say like, oh my gosh, am I seeing this right? Or yeah. are there red flags here that I'm missing? You know, what do you see that I don't? Or what, where's a green light? It's really so nice to be able to bounce that reality off your friends and get feedback from people you trust. Yeah, I think it's all about empathy. I think the mm-hmm. green lights is empathy, support, being mm-hmm. open, mm-hmm. Um, genuine, warmth. When the red flags are there, I think of like rigidity and yeah. just not being flexible. You know, the acceptance and commitment therapy model talks about psychological flexibility, which is mm. a great model to use for chronic pain. You know, this acceptance piece where it's mm-hmm. like, okay, um, acceptance isn't positive or negative, but it's like a moment of here I am in the present moment. 
Yeah. yeah. So that you bring up such a really great point. What are some red flags that that people with chronic illness or disability might look for in partners to find out if they are going to be safe and healthy partners for them? Yeah. So one of the red flags is if someone is not open about things or there's a lack mm. of empathy or if they go out on a date and they start to talk a little bit about their disability and the person just dismisses them mm. or they're not very interested in what they have yeah. to say. I had a, I have a good friend who's diagnosed with um, lupus mm -hmm. and she chatted with a guy for a while and connected with him. And he was a ER physician. So she thought, okay, he's a doctor. So maybe he's sensitive to this. And so she went out on this date and he was like, you know, I really do think a lot of folks with, with chronic pain, they're attention seeking and they always want to just wow. come in and get more meds. And she was floored. She was mm. like, wow, I'm very disappointed. So I think it's all about really getting to know the person before mm -hmm. you go out on a date with them, mm. maybe have some conversations and see how that goes. You know, often, sometimes a lot of people don't want to go too far into that because mm -hmm. then if they really start to like and feel the chemistry, they go meet them. And then it's like, oh man, yeah. you know, yeah, <laughs> it's like, let me meet right away that way, you know, but I yeah. think when you've got a disability, it's important to really get to know the person, see what that empathy looks like mm -hmm. instead of just, okay, let's go meet. So it can go both ways. Yeah. 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 I really mm -hmm. hear that. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, which, um, which risk are you willing to take the risk that you might waste some time and get emotionally invested and then meet someone mm -hmm. and it doesn't work out, um, or meet them right up front and, you know, spend that, spend your time and your energy taking that strategy. But I really exactly. like what you said about kind of paying attention to how someone responds to your experience. That's yeah. really important. I think whether you are able-bodied or disabled, whether you have a, a, a chronic illness or not, really thinking about how does this person that I'm evaluating as a good fit partner for me take into consideration what mm -hmm. my experience is and, and, you know, vice versa, right? How, yeah. do, how do I factor in their experience too? Exactly. So what would you say to partners of people with disabilities or chronic illness in terms of, you know, how to support their partner or how mm -hmm. to encourage their partner, how to ask questions? So my thing is, is that I always say that you need the big four for a relationship to work. And that's trust, honesty, communication, and respect. You can't mm -hmm. have one or two. And what I find is when one gets knocked down, it knocks down the others like a domino mm -hmm. effect. So mm -hmm. there is this curiosity that has to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. And so being able to sit with that, I think that if a couple is together and then all of a sudden there's a diagnosis, it can be quite traumatic and there's a lot of grief. Yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of grief. So being able to hold space for each other and to go through a grief process, I find there are different stages that folks go through mm -hmm. with a chronic illness condition. So that first phase that a couple may experience is crisis, where mm -hmm. there is a crisis and they want answers immediately. Right. Once they may have answers, if they get those, then they will go into stabilization where they're stabilizing the ill partner with their body, medication regimens, surgeries, those types mm -hmm. of things. Okay. And so making sure they're communicating about that and having that support, then we start to see a resolution phase where they're getting familiar with their body. They're forming a relationship with their illness. Mm -hmm. Their partner is invested. They're reading about it. At this time, this is when I really start to see people come in for therapy mm. because they're forming a relationship they know how to react to their illness. They may yeah. be remission, relapses and remission with the illness that they may sure. have. And then of course they want to become sexual again. Mm -hmm. And so we start to see an acceptance piece come in like, Hey, we've grieved, which I think is really critical at first. Mm -hmm. Usually when someone is going through a fight crisis phase and stabilization phase, they may not be quite sexual. They're kind of like, sex is the last thing I'm thinking about right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to stabilize my body. And so then we get into the sex piece where they're really wanting to connect again. Yes. And so classic sex therapy techniques may come out in that. But if there's something deeper going on, I feel like we've got the content and the process. The content is the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the sexual challenge. Low desire, mm -hmm. arousal, erectile issues, painful sex for the female mm -hmm. partner or vulva owner. And then we need to do some deeper work where right. they can really listen to each other and hear each other 
And of course, I use a lot of Imago relationship therapy mm, for that. Okay. Um, Imago image means an image in Latin. So people pick their partner based on the positive and negative characteristics of our caretakers and it's mm -hmm. unconscious. Mm -hmm. And then there's the conscious piece. So I use a lot of that work to help them communicate and to find out what are your sexual interests in this new normal of something mm -hmm. now, yeah. you know, we may not be able to have penetrative sex, but maybe we can get creative and do some other things. Sex at its heart is about communication. Yeah. Yeah. Communication, but exploration <laughs> and play. And play. Yeah. yeah. And what is your body like now with play? Right, like, right. what does that look like? Um, so all of those things can be helpful. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm really hearing is that, you know, when people are going through maybe a new diagnosis or an exacerbation of symptoms, mm -hmm. it really can elicit a, a whole different um, opportunity for their relationship to take a new form together. And, and as they assimilate yeah. everything that is brought about by the illness, the disability, or the, the relapse, mm -hmm. then it, it's like, how do we make sense of all of the pieces of who we are again, now that they might be in slightly different form, or they might yes. have a different tone to them. And so what, how do we, how do we make them fit now? How do we make it fit? It's this yeah. new normal of a new life that we're going into. Yeah. And how do we make that work as a couple? Mm. Now I've had some couples come in where the one partner has no desire at all. It's like, I mm. don't want to do this, but hey, you're a sexual being. So if you want to open some things up, mm -hmm. we can talk about that. So sometimes mm -hmm. I help couples do that okay. where they want to go into some non-monogamy, see what that's like, mm -hmm. or they don't. And they want to continue to explore with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, the other partner has a lot of anxiety too. Sometimes it's not the ill partner. Sometimes right. the one that is, is able body or they don't have an illness. It's like, I'm afraid I'm going to injure my partner. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the other partner is like, I don't care. Just take me. Let's try this. <laughs> and the other partner is like, I don't know if I want to do that because yeah. I don't want to hurt you. So right. we talk about the fear factor that goes mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what was their sex life like before mm -hmm. a chronic illness, you know, sure. so we have to take that good old classic sex history of things of what was your life like prior to a chronic illness. So right. we do a lot of that work too. Yeah, that's great. That's mm -hmm. really great. Yeah. Um, so let's, let me think a little bit here for a second. What are some, what are some things that uh, someone living with a chronic illness should make clear ahead of time in being intimate with a potential partner? They really should talk about consent, what it mm -hmm. means to them, what feels good to them, what's off limits. There may be a part on their body where they have no sensation mm -hmm. or it hurts them. What is the temperature of the room? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that setting look like to them? Mm -hmm. And how can they be pleased? And also, what can I do to please you? So there mm -hmm. is this conversation that has to happen. And it's almost like, um, I kind of think of it sometimes like a BDSM scene, how there is consent. You're talking about the scene. You're talking mm -hmm. about what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, mm -hmm. what's off limits for me. It's always about that. And I actually have a lot of clients that have chronic pain that are involved in kink mm -hmm. because it gives them a way to distract from the the bad pain versus the good pain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Sensory redirection. Yeah. And I'm in yeah. control of this pain, whereas this pain over here is happening to me and I can't do anything to stop that. Exactly. So that feels yeah. like it really can champion mm -hmm. a lot of agency and give people power back in their bodies. Power back in their bodies. And we're seeing yeah. this come out in research now and I'm going to yeah. write, this is going to be in my book. I mean, okay. it's all in my book, being able to talk more about that and how folks mm -hmm. that can look at kink from a different perspective mm -hmm. um, in terms of their chronic illness and how there is this control, right? Because we love mm -hmm. to be in control. And when we're not in control of our pain, mm -hmm. um, that causes more anxiety. Or when we try to control the bad pain, we find ourselves having more flare-ups because mm -hmm. there are the psychological factors that influence the physical symptoms. Exactly. Exactly. So if I'm anxious, it's all in the vagal process mm -hmm. too, right? If I go into that fight and flight response so much right. and I go into freeze where I've got more depression and shame, mm -hmm. that's going to trigger more of the painful, the, the, the pain. And I can't focus on the good things. And yeah. 
you know, when you go into a play scene or a BDSM scene, you know, whether you're a dom or a sub, mm-hmm. it's like you're acting. It's so much fun. <laughs> It definitely can be. It can be. It can be. And it can be fun. And you're constantly having to communicate with each other. Right. Right. Yeah. It can, it can really create such um, an amazing uh, connection between people where they Mm -hmm. do communicate more so about what's happening in the moment than they do in any other part of their lives. I mean, yeah. Do you, are you so communicative when you slice tomatoes to put them on top of a pizza? No, but when you're kinky with someone in bed, you're talking about how do you like this? Do you like it like that? Harder, softer? It's such a, a more in, uh, intentional dialogue. It is. It's very intentional. Mm-hmm. And I think that when you're coping with disability and negotiating, mm-hmm. that's important too, right? Absolutely. Like I'm getting more familiar with my body. And so a lot of times we do a lot of work into that. What is pleasurable to me as a human being and what's unique to me so I can share that with my partner. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a way that you masturbate that's comfortable to you with a Mm -hmm. disability, show that with your partner, guide that with them. And sometimes, you know, seeing a sex therapist helps with that too because of the communication piece. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What are some other resources that you would recommend for people either with chronic illness or disabilities or their partners who want to self-educate and, you know, be supportive? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a classic one and it's so great, but the ultimate guide to sex and disability is a fantastic book. It's one of the first Mm -hmm. books that came out with this. And then also, you know, there are uh, several journal articles. If you go to my website, drleephillips.com, I have a resources page um, that can guide you. Um, I think that's a great resource. There's um, a lot of different organizations like ASEC that you can look up and get some information off of there, Mm -hmm. you know, that I find very helpful. One of my favorite researchers is out of the University of Michigan in the School of Social Work, Shana Katz Katari, K-A-T-Z, and Katari is K-A-T-T-A-R-I. She does a lot of research in this work. And Mm -hmm. so following her, um, there's there's so many people. So if you go to ASEC and see that, that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And there is a great book out there that I love too, called How to Live Well with Chronic Pain and Illness Mm. by a woman named Tony Bernhard, B-E-R-N. H-A-R-D, she's fabulous. Um, Mm. How she has a chronic illness herself and she has used mindfulness and Mm -hmm. a lot of cognitive techniques that can be very helpful. So those are some resources. She also wrote another book called How to Be Sick, which is a fantastic book Mm. that is all about how mindfulness is integrated with chronic pain. Oh, illness. that's great. That's great. Yeah. We'll, I'll put all of the um, references and resources that you mentioned in the show notes for anyone who's, yeah. who's couldn't keep up writing with, with all of those great resources. Right. And, <laughs> and of course my website has uh, a resources page that I try to add to every time a new book comes out that I find oh, great. that's great. I try to add to that so folks can can see that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, are there any things, are are there any elements of the experience of sex with chronic illness or disability that we didn't talk about today that you think it's really important for us to address? Um, I think the one thing just to reiterate, I guess, is just really just get familiar with your body. What Mm -hmm. is really feeling good to you? Make sure that you're taking inventory of that, making sure that you are communicating the way that you want to communicate. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm a big, you know, I'm a psychotherapist and sex therapist and a relationship therapist, but I can't tell you enough how important it is to go seek help. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really want to talk to someone about it, who specializes in this, we don't have many therapists out there who focus on chronic illness as much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, great to reach out to folks. I'm sure there are more out there, but um, it's really important to know what feels good to you. So you can share Mm -hmm. that with someone and to also go through the grief process because we know that grief is not linear. So focus on that, focus on the depression, the bargaining, the anger that comes with it can be really helpful if you can work through those feelings. Yeah. And honor that process because it, you know, chronic illness or disability for many people, especially if they happen suddenly in life and it's it's not something that someone was born with, Mm -hmm. can really take them uh, by surprise and can pivot, it can create such a big pivot in their lives. And it Mm -hmm. is important to acknowledge 
the impact that that has and the grief that can come up around it. Absolutely. People. And yeah. a lot of times we find that when we can work through that, then we can get into this life of acceptance and really mm -hmm. form a relationship with your disability. Yeah. You know, and make it, it's a part of your life. It doesn't define who you are. And that's the last phase of the chronic illness journey is integration, mm -hmm. where you can mm -hmm. integrate parts of your old self mm -hmm. into your new self. Mm -hmm. Look at it like an adventure. And there's creativity now that you can get into. Yeah, I hear that. What I hear when you say that is unapologetic empowerment. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Nice. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining me today. This was so helpful. And where can people reach you if they have questions or want to learn more about your podcast or your resources? Yeah. So you can like look for me on my website, which is uh, drleephillips.com. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Instagram, social media at Dr. Mm -hmm. Lee Phillips and also on Facebook at Dr. Lee Phillips and Dr. Lee Phillips on Twitter. Um, you know, I check my messages all the time and be more than happy to, to reach out to you if you have a question. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Modern Intimacy. Follow our show on your favorite podcast app by going to modernintimacy.com slash podcast. And while you're there, don't forget to enter in a question or a topic idea for future episodes. That's modernintimacy.com slash podcast. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not a substitute for therapy or psychiatric care. Listening to this show or submitting questions or topic ideas does not constitute a therapeutic or professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or any providers that work at Modern Intimacy. If you're having a medical or psychiatric emergency, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are those of the guests only and are not necessarily indicative of those opinions held by Dr. Kate Balistrieri or staff at Modern Intimacy. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more episode information and helpful tips, visit modernintimacy.com or follow us on Instagram at The Modern Intimacy or follow Dr. Kate on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrieri. See you next week.